General of the State Police. I have my staff members that will introduce themselves, but we know there's been a lot of discussion about immigration policy all around the country and the state also. What the state police want to do is we want to foster trust. We want anybody in Rhode Island or any place who, have, who is a victim or they have an issue to come to the state police. Um, we want to make sure that people who are victims of crimes or who know of a crime, that they feel free to come to us without prosecution from us or, you know, we're not, I think you'll see in the policy, uh, the Rhode Island State Police does not enforce, we're not immigration agents. We don't enforce immigration law, we're not immigration agents, uh, we don't even go down that road. It's in the policy several times. I think the thing is we want people to look at the policy, it's a, it's a long policy, and any questions you may have, we would like to put you at ease or give you the correct. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of misinformation out there. We want to make sure everybody knows what exactly the Brown State Police does in certain situations and what we can do for victims of crime. The most important thing here is we want to investigate the crime that people are bringing to us. If they're a victim of a crime, we want to investigate that crime. That's the bottom line. That's what we're here for. Currently, we have several task forces out there. We work with immigration on several things. Um, <coughs> ICE agents are not permitted to come to headquarters and speak to someone at headquarters about their immigration status. Where a crime victim comes to Rhode Island State Police mm -hmm. to present their situation, I would like to know that if there is an ICE agent on the premises, that they're clearly identified as an ICE agent. Uh, we, we wouldn't have a scenario where that's, we don't have immigration agents very rarely here, and they, they would never be. I see what you're saying. They would never be, say a complainant came to their front desk, which where it would stop. An immigration agent would never be within those confines. Yeah. It's just a, it, the only place they would possibly be would be in the second floor working with detectives. They would never be, they would never have access to someone who comes in to report a crime. Would the state police allow ICE agents to come in for enforcement of civil immigration law? To headquarters? No. Of civil, no. 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 But not, but, but for a... Um, you know, a felony, uh, something like that? Yeah, you're never going to, per our policy, you're never going to get a scenario where an immigration agent is allowed to speak to someone in our custody about anything besides what they're in our custody for, which wouldn't be a deportation, an That's immigration okay. issue anyway. It would be the crime that we have them there for, which wouldn't happen anyway because an immigration agent wouldn't be involved in an investigation like that. We have one on our fugitive task force. They pick up fugitives, but we'll make sure they're clearly identified as members of our task force. For example, that's a good point because I said we have several task force out there. We have agents from everywhere, FBI, HSI. But when they're assigned to our task force, a task force that's run by the state police, they abide by our policies. That's, that's a big distinction. Because you're going to see task forces out there with several eight province police, war police. But when they're a member of the Rhode Island State Police Task Force, which would be our HIDA, our drug task force, our fugitive task force run by us and the U.S. Marshals, they abide by Rhode Island State Police policies. They actually have to read the policies and sign off on them before they're allowed to practice as a member of that task force. When some of our organizations met with the governor, we had asked about um, limiting the state police from participating in the surveillance of political and religious groups, which we know have happened elsewhere. Um, but we didn't see anything addressed in this document or the policy about that. And we're, I'm wondering if you could address what the current state police policy is on that. So on surveillance of political or religious groups, something like that? Mm -hmm. Surveillance is that we, we have to, we, sometimes we have to conduct surveillance on groups that come under our radar. It's, uh, we can't really eliminate that. Um, I'll just tell you, like post after 9-11, I worked with the Joint Terrorism Task Force along with Lieutenant Colonel Barry. There was a lot of surveillance done on a lot of different organizations, and it's just, it, it was the way it was back then. Very rarely do we do that now, but we, we, we are gonna, we're going to conduct surveillance on people we feel may be of interest to us. Or groups. Or groups. If you think about it, organized crime. Yes. Hell's Angels. I think that would be... It's a matter of public safety. Yes. Is there a written policy that describes what what types of situations would fall under that? Or it, it's not really. It, it's just, it's, it will go case by case basis, you know, what the reason for the surveillance would be. We don't uh, conduct a lot of surveillances. Uh, we have detective bureaus that do a lot of it, but as an agency, we do some of it, but now I wouldn't consider it a lot. But it's a, like the colonel said, it's a public safety issue.
Yeah, it's just something that needs to be done. It's something that uh, that comes up. A deportation order by ICE is not or is something that the state police must abide by. No, if you look at if you look at actually, yeah. oh, we put it right now. The first okay. section A of the, of the procedure part, right on right. Investigating and enforcing violations of federal civil civil immigration law is not the responsibility of our now state police. Okay. So you, you're correct, sir. It, we don't enforce it, but it's, it, it becomes part of the investigation that immigration has to handle on their own. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a, a deportation order and we have one other charges, like I said, that's up to immigration. We'll let the court aware of that. We don't enforce that. So Maybe I can clarify a little bit. I think people are confused about um, a detainer, a deportation detainer. That case in Massachusetts dealt with a deportation detainer um, where an ICE agent used to be able to call the police and say, hey, look, for no good reason, we think maybe that that person is undocumented. Could you hold them? And the police routinely would do so. Um, we don't honor any type of a detainer like that. The only detainer, it's not, the only, it's not a detainer, the only order we honor is a deportation order signed by a judge that that person is being deported. So in, in, anything like a uh, deportation detainer, they can ask us to do it, we won't do it. But when you say you honor it, what does that mean that you do when you discover that there is an actual In order? Deportation? If you look at the policy, there are two, two um, attachments to the back. So we would have to receive both of those attachments um, telling us that there is a deportation order signed by a federal judge. Mm -hmm. um, we would take those to court with us and inform the judge. Uh, most likely, if we are investigating a crime, and that crime um, is serious enough, that person is going to be held anyway. Um, so these things only come into play when, say, that person goes to court and gets bail. All right, so now the only thing holding them, if anything, is this deportation order. And that's up to the judge to make that determination. We just you know, make them aware of it. And you're affirmatively required to make them aware of it, even if ICE hasn't gotten itself involved yet? They, they've gotten themselves involved if they have sent those documents to us. Okay. They would have to come up with the real order at some point. Right. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long they have. I, I've heard 48 hours. And it, because what we would do is we would send someone to the ACI. We don't hold people here. So the ACI is well aware of these documents. They won't accept anybody unless they have these documents, <coughs> uh, the two documents that I'm talking about. And if they, that, that third document, I guess the, the order itself doesn't come within a certain period of time, they'll release that. Anyway. So that's the only time, and I hope, hope you understand this, the two different things, the detainer, we're not dealing with the detainer at all, that's off the table. Just these one orders, it's only one particular reason we would hold somebody. State Council of Churches, uh, Rabbi Franklin from the Board of Rabbis, there are others of us from the faith community. And a year or so ago, we had uh, a big meeting in one of the churches in Providence with a couple hundred people who were interested in providing, um, or at least talking about the possibility of, of providing um, a safe place for people who were about to be deported. Would you be likely to be there if we had if there were 200 church people there and, and um, congregational people there, Jewish people there? Do you show up at those kind of events if to see I, what trouble? Yeah, as part of our out community outreach program, if I'm invited or we invite as a division, we will be present. So we invite you to come. Yes, if we invited you to come, you would come. Absolutely. I, uh, a number of our community partners are here today. Uh, I attended the forum at the MSPD within the last year. I know a number of people here who were at that forum. Uh, if we're invited, we will attend. If there's any uh, questions you have, we'll answer them. And, and what would your reaction be to those of us in the faith community who are considering um, um, offering sanctuary in our, in our churches, our synagogues, our schools? That's something that you can do. Um, you have, you have a mission that you're on. Um, we have a mission that are on, but that is totally up to you as far as sanctuary uh, churches. And we will go to the meetings, and if we can help in any way as far as 
explain. People have questions, especially we're very concerned about victims. Victims not coming forward, we would be there. We're certainly not going to go there and try to arrest people if that's one of the things you're thinking about. Then we're going to go there and start asking for identification. That's totally nothing that we would get involved in. The only time we're going to get involved in this is if we get someone under arrest that has a detainer order that we've been talking about signed by a judge. That's the only time we're going to get involved. fingerprinting process. Um, to get the specifics, suppose a trooper pulls over a car for a minor traffic violation on 95. The driver and the passenger are unable to present uh, proper, uh, a proper license. What, what are the next steps that happen if these people end up getting in, into getting their fingerprints taken? And I'm glad you asked that. We went through it. If you're the, that's probably the, one of the biggest concerns. So you're stopped on that number 95 for, like you said, a traffic violation. If you're the operator of the vehicle, you have to identify yourself to us. You have to show you have an active license and so forth. If, some, if the operator of the vehicle gives us an, a name that he or she is going by, we must check that name to confirm you have an active license. It's not to check anything else at that point. Um, if we check that name and no license comes back, well, then you're stepping into the, the zone of obstructing because you're not giving us a name that we can verify or it's a false name. That would bring criminal charges. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, Say, say, you had, say you didn't have your license on you, and you gave me a little name, uh, John Doe, I run John Doe, you have a license. Okay, here's the ticket. That's it. You don't get run through NCIC or BCI. It's just a license check to verify who you are. With that license check, we'll come with Social Security number, which I would ask you and give you a Social Security number to verify that you are indeed who you say you are. But it, it, as, it, as it progress, if we can't identify you, then the trooper on the road is going to suspect that there's some kind of obstruction going on because you keep giving different names, which we run into occasionally. But, I mean, if I give my real name, I yeah. don't have a social security number because I'm an undocumented immigrant. Mm -hmm. And you have a like, you have an active license? No. 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 You don't have an active license? No. no you, would be, you would be issued a violation. You'd be issued no a violation. Violations. The car would be towed, and you'd have to go to court on the violation. So I prosecute all these in, in court, and I run into that all the time. Um, and what we do is we try to give people opportunities to get their license before they find them. But it's a fine now. A suspended license or a license that or no license at all. Right. It's just a, a violation now. It used to be a misdemeanor or it was Well, what happens to the person? So the car is towed. Mm -hmm. Is the person taking the state police no. headquarters? No, it's a, sense. It's, a sense. it's a traffic sense. Just like a speeding ticket. Mm -hmm. If the car is towed, what? Well, they can't drive the you car. You can't drive the car. So say they have a license calls. operator with them. Yeah. We turn it over to that license operator. But a lot of times, if they by themselves, the car would be towed. And we just talked about this upstairs. I think you're probably going to get to the point of you don't have you don't have a license on you, and you may have a warrant, or an order for deportation. In that, and you know, you're the operator of that vehicle. We'll be taking you into custody. No, we would not, okay. because we don't have criminal charges on you. We just have a, a, a traffic violation. That's probably the biggest question we get. I'm glad you asked that because that's a good scenario. You don't have a license. You're undocumented. You don't have a social security number, so you don't have a license. So it, it shows up when we run your name. It shows up you have an order, uh, order of deportation. There's so many names for it. You're messing up. It used to be called detainers. detainers. We'll be taking the custody. No, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. We would issue the traffic summons. Of course, immigration is going to be made aware of the fact that we have you stopped, and they will probably call up and say, well, we, we did have him stopped. He or she stopped. Here's a result of that. Do you have a headquarters? No, we don't. How would immigration be told? Yeah. Because if you if, if you run the name looking for a license, and we can't find a license, can't find anything, we have to keep the, we have to know who we're dealing with for public safety. Unfortunately, on the side of the road, it's a number one. It's a, it's a very dangerous spot. We have to know who we're going. Now, this is just operator-wise. The operator must identify. So you can ask the passengers for an ID. They really don't have to produce one. Most people do, but you don't have to produce one. But you have to know who you're dealing with for public safety. So just the. It, so it's not just the imi the uh, fingerprints. It's just. Yeah, if you run someone, you run running someone. somebody will will alert ICE. It depends on how you run them. Like, a yeah, license yeah. check will not. A BCI and NCIC, Triple these other they will they BCI will bring it up. BCI and would yeah. you? NCIC is the National Crime Information Center. That right. will bring up anything. BCI is a state like but a state morale. When, BCI. When uh, when you have a p person mm -hmm. on the sh pulling somebody over, mm -hmm. how do they determine what level of of, of notification is warranted because I think what a lot of us fear 
and you know, we, we want to go by the good graces of, 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 of those that are wearing the badges, mm -hmm. but we do fear that somebody might be called up, pulled over because they happen to not be the right skin, they happen to not be the right whatever, that sort of creates that mental alert. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a potential immigrant, and the immigrant might not, might be somebody that shouldn't be here. And so there's this nether, nether world of, of what can we assume is the nature of that crime that is going to alert people, and you know, that most of a lot of other people might not find themselves in this net. That, well, that's that's okay. not how we operate. Well, I want to. And, that's and we just want to make know. make clear that that's not how we operate as an organization. And um, the, what the colonel was talking about is when we actually have a violation, and then it may be taken to another step. But the what you're talking about, that's not how we operate as an organization. Right. Mm -hmm. You'll see it in several of our policies that our troopers do not. By taking bias based policing, we do not do that. It's in this policy. Too. It's in this policy, right okay. in this policy. But it's in right. several of our policies. So the, the captain's right, we do not. But do again, not what, that all right, let's go back to what you did say, mm -hmm. which was originally it was just the fingerprinting, but then it was this the levels of notification, um, some of which can be in the ICE mm -hmm. network. Correct. And it seems to me it's up to an individual who they get in touch with them to, to in other right, words, even, if it's really if a we, benign, if it's really a benign occurrence of uh, someone jumped a stop, mm -hmm. you know, and... Right, but the way the scenario was given, it was John Doe gets stopped, mm -hmm. he doesn't have a driver's license. We check, and he doesn't have a driver's license. Right. He's going to be an issue to violation and sent on his way. Okay. But if the, if the officer believes that he may not be telling the truth about his name, um, and I'm not sure exactly what the facts and circumstances around that, but that would maybe bring it up to a different level. So now maybe he would want to do some checks on the name that he was given. And if he was given a name that came back through this NCIC computer and it alerted us that there was an immigration detainer, we're not going to do anything anyway because there's no underlying crime right. Right, to arrest him for. So I think what the colonel was saying is we would take that information and make a note of it. I'm not sure where that would go, to be honest with you. Okay, but he um, would be let go then at that yes. point. Yeah, okay. we have checks and balances also. That, and I only, only think that a trooper on the road, when something of this severity comes out, this checks and balances. He's going to report that to a corporal the next it's going to get. It's probably going to get to the lieutenant colonel or the captain or the colonel itself because it is such a big thing. Okay. And that decision wouldn't be made solely by the trooper on the side of the road. But I'm just telling you here now, it, in the case of a traffic ticket, and an, uh, an uh, immigration order of, of the, you know, uh, deportation comes up, we are not keeping that person for it. They are let go with the traffic ticket. Because there's really no way to verify that that person on that deportation order is that person. You know, we don't have an ID, we don't have a license, so we're not going to hold somebody with such questionable circumstances around it. That's up to immigration to, to do their job. However, if a warrant came back, which was a judge-issued warrant, you would then take the person to No. Not under that circumstance. Well, what kind of an underlying crime? Well, it's still, you're talking about a, a federal warrant or like a state warrant for federal period? Right. Yes, right. Be, yes. Oh, that's sure. a crime. It'd be right. taken, yes. Yeah. But not, not, not an immigration order that yeah. we were talking about earlier. Not a detainer. Not, not a detainer. Okay. Okay. So any kind of state warrant from a family court, sure. district court, we would, they would be taken. That's, that's an arrestable offense. And then the other question, just to follow up, is if you don't take them into custody, do you just leave them on the side of the road? No, no, never. That's right. safety. Oh. We have public safety. No, absolutely not. So our job is to make sure that people are safe, whether they didn't have a license or not. And we make sure we've given many rides home. Oh. Um, if they're minors, we've called their parents. We have a responsibility, so absolutely not. No, we would never do that. And so when you give them a ride home to their address, is that information also entered into the system? Just the, the address and the ticket will be in the If it's a different address, if the address that's given on the summons will be given as information that someone can get. Thank you. If I can just follow yeah, up, sure. uh, I'm still trying to understand the situation where the person is pulled over. Um, they gave it because you talked about the need to verify who they are. So this is a person who's undocumented, but does not have an order of removal. Uh, has been under the the radar, so you really aren't able to confirm who they are. 
do you still just give them the ticket and let them go on their way, or does something follow from that? We have to be able to then, this this several things. So we, you, yeah, so say that the resident is a Lucy's province. Say the person pulled over from the province. We can check interagency. We can check if province has ever had contact with this person. We can check, and we can go as far as to check, you know, uh, utilities at a house. You say you live at this house, we can check, does that person live there? I, I see what you're saying, if this, because it does come instances whether you can't you can't identify somebody if they're undocumented. You have you have to you have to verify who that person is. We can't let somebody let's put it this way, we can't let an operator of a vehicle go without identifying who they are. It's just public safety. Because you don't know who you're dealing with, so we have to identify them. But the reason we're asking these questions is not because he's undocumented. No. Because we're trying to find out who he is who he is start that license violation. That's right. the sole purpose of finding questions being asked. So on the um, on a traffic stop, the operator of the car is responsible. I understand for giving mm -hmm. identification. None of the other passengers are responsible. They don't have to. They can refuse. But um, I'm wondering if local um, law, municipalities uh, laws differ in that. Say, like in Jamestown, somebody stopped. Do you? Yeah. You know, well, I you know I think each local municipality they have their own policies in place. They deal with town managers and they could have do something different as far as, so I really can't speak for the local municipalities. We do cooperate. If they ask for guidance from us or they ask, we, we show them policies, we give them guides, but they are responsible for their own towns and cities. So Colonel, as far as state law, I think that's what you're asking about. That's universal across the state. Mm -hmm. The driver has to identify himself. Passengers are always asked. Police always ask passengers. But if they just flatly refuse, there's not much that the police can do about that. Mm -hmm. That's the same in Jamestown, Warwick, or anywhere in the state that we feel like. So they couldn't, a local municipality couldn't pass a law that would then... Um, they could try, but they could try. I'm sorry, I didn't work out. They could try. They could try. Thank you. Answer, they <laughs> because it feels to many of us in the community that the ground that we're standing on is changing every day. Sense. And one of the things that has come to light recently is some of the new immigration-related requirements that have been imposed by the Department of Justice for the Burn JAG funding. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but they are um, particularly concerning uh, because it does make it clear that there is a responsibility for the state to notify ICE in advance if someone's in custody um, so that it's putting, it sounds like it's putting more responsibility on local the state law enforcement to notify ICE and not putting it on them to find the person. And I'm wondering if you're aware of those new requirements and if you're planning to agree to them to receive the burn jack funding. No, we're, we're in compliance. I know, I know we're in compliance with this. We haven't had any issues. In fact, if we reach out to them when we arrest someone and we send those fingerprints out, we're going to comply yeah. with the compliance regulations. So we're confident we're going to continue to get our, our funding. I believe these are new requirements that will be for the next wave of funding. And so, so it's changing all the time, you're right. So I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, but we can talk about it later if you want. There often can be, I think you would agree, a gap between policy and practice. And you know, there certainly is a perception that I hear about from the immigrant community about the way um, traffic stop enforcement works. Um, and I've been here a long time. I know how Rhode, Island drive, Rhode Islanders drive, um, but I'm, I'm always surprised, <coughs> excuse me, at how many people we hear about, Latino drivers we hear about, are pulled over for not using their directional signal to change lanes. Now, um, you go out on the highway, you could pick anybody you wanted to. How do you address the perception that um, uh, traffic violations like that are being used by police as pretext to stop people based on their their race or ethnicity. A lot of tra it's training. Um, you know, the Motor Vehicle Code book is, is a large book too, um, and it's it's discretion and it's it's training. Um, you have to really make sure your men and women are trained. Um, to understand traffic violations. So there's a lot of gray there because there's so many circumstances that go on. So I can't really speak for other people how they're doing their stops. I can speak as far as what we do to make sure our troopers are doing it the right way. Um, we have systems in place. But other agencies, again, it's training and it's discretionary and it's so gray out there because you really don't know the, all the circumstances. So I really can't, I mean, we, we can train our people 
Um, as far as other agencies, there are some people who specialize in traffic, traffic enforcement. And there's so many traffic, in the book itself, there's so many things, it's, it's a violation for that. It's, a, it's an aggressive driving, it's this and that. So that's, that's a tough interpretation. But I think if people have a complaint and they feel they were pulled over for nothing, or it's still a violation, and, and you would need more interpretation, especially if somebody feels they're being mistreated or they're being singled out for not having any violations. So I, I think it's going to get back to um, an investigation at that local agency or somebody complaining or asking for more uh, you know, interpretation. Sometimes they'll go to traffic court and that will come up and they'll want more of an explanation, but it's, it's you know, there's a lot of traffic motor vehicle codes out there. And for this, it would help that we do the point that <laughs> the, we can pull over a person for anything, so then the concern is, are people being pulled over for... I think you have to rely on the training of that trooper or officer, and especially deal with somebody who's, who's not trained correctly or doesn't understand or is doing something wrong. Because uh, we, we're a highly accredited agency, but we, we investigate any complaint like that. If I, may, if I may, Mr. Brown, just to add on that, in part of our professional standards uh, unit, they monitor every quarter they pull 500 tickets from various stops that we have over the course of that time period. And they go through each ticket to make sure that there's no racial profiling, the stop was correct, things like that. So we have checks and balances in place already for our troopers. And they're required to maintain those standards. If they're not, the professional unit or internal affairs office officer will contact their immediate supervisor and start an investigation to clarify what actually happened there. So have, in looking at those the, the traffic stop cards, have you actually found instances of racial disparities among particular troopers? And I, any I can tell you we're constantly in the 97 to 99% rate, rate that we're doing it the right way. We're very confident in our men and women here at the state police that, that we are doing it the right way. Hi. So overall, if the, the stats on Latinos being pulled over for traffic violations, overall, is it does it skew Latino? Is it larger than the percentage of Rhode Islanders that are Latino? No, we also have, we also break that down individually with a uh, white, a dark Hispanic, a uh, white, black, white, black, uh, black female. And it doesn't. It's it does not. And if I can just. Uh, say so. We actually uh, have data for the first first quarter of the CCP area of the community. I can never remember the whole name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and so we actually yeah. put down. We actually I actually did some counting of the data when you state police specifically um, of searches. And when it comes to uh, Hispanic, black, and no, you're Hispanic talking about searches. Searches. Different yes, category. correctly. Yes, yes. It, because it was <coughs> one specific part that we were focusing on. That actually was disproportionately higher for Latino drivers or Hispanic drivers than any other drivers. But I think it also calls into question the search mm -hmm. is an inventory search mm -hmm. if that car is getting towed or if there's an arrest. So I know from those being attending some of those meetings, that was a bone of contention because it's actually almost like a double reporting mechanism sometimes. So if that's an unregistered car, there's no license, part of our responsibility and policy-wise is we wind up inventorying that car. So if you had whatever's in that car that's of value, we want to make sure that you get that back in return and that we've documented so that there's nothing missing of value to you. So that's that inventory search, and I know that was it, sort yeah, of that. Yeah, I actually looked at the different category. It just wasn't inventory. It was odor uh, for drugs or alcohol. It was uh, reasonable suspicion. There were five right. categories of yeah, it, so, right. and, and in two barracks specifically, it was higher for Latinos. Yeah, I'm not, not, I'd like to see, like, definitely we should talk about that, and I'd like to see what you have on it because um, and that was just we're aware of, yeah, we're aware of, I'd like to be specific and exactly see what you have. Yeah.